And it moves on to the body because we are psychosomatic people. We have bodies and we have minds and we're learning more and more about the interface between those two. So the work with the body begins with certain uh, asanas. Uh, they, asanas is possible and some of them are to produce flexibility and to keep our muscles from just contracting over age. But then the other aim is to quiet the body, to still the body. You know, you can lie flat and you'll be quiet, but how about being alert? Having done that, they move on to the breath, as it were, the doorway between the mind and the body. And breath is, is, is essential to this. It's really a concentration of the breath, isn't it? The breath is probably the most useful thing to concentrate on because it is like a bridge from the physical. It is physical. Air is physical. And yet it's invisible and it is so diaphanously physical that it is a natural link between our bodies and our consciousness. And then from the body we move on to the mind. If it wanders, you simply notice that it's wandering and then come back, bring it back to counting your breaths, which is a good way to bring the focus of the mind. And then, finally, this leads into a stage where you lose awareness of yourself and 100% you're focused on what you are, uh, that little Josh Dick, the burning ember or whatever it is, and then beyond that, even that disappears and the mind is simply alone with the infinite, with no imagery at all. Well, I have more than just an intellectual curiosity about this, because even as we talk, I'm undergoing a program in cardiac conditioning right here in New York at Beth Israel Hospital. Oh, uh, good, good. And the third part of this program is elementary yoga. Yes. And I'm only a novitiate. I'm brand new. I've just been <laughs> well, welcome to the club. To it. But I wish we could find words to explain to people what words barely hint at, because it is a, a changing consciousness oh, yeah. that somehow calms the emotions, liberates the mind from this frenetic Dang. running, and by the end of the hour, uh, well, there's an old Taoist saying to the mind that is still, the world surrenders. Yeah. And there is a moment at which it simply seems my life is li as still as the reflection of the moon in the calm of the lake. Wonderful, wonderful. But again, yeah. these are only words. They're not the experience. Of course, of course. But as they say, they are pointers to the moon, even they are not the moon, but they give, as you spoke, you know, I get the sense of what you're saying. But it's not a weird experience. It's just an unusual experience because we are so, we in the West are so unaccustomed to this kind of natural state of yeah. being. I hope this is not a metaphor for our whole conversation, <laughs> Bill, because when one gets into the things of the spirit, was, uh, it, it really, words can do something, but it is so ultimately and basically an experiential matter that uh, if one hears only the words, what? Oh, an old Hindu prayer, O oh, thou before whom all words fail. Oh, wonder, recoil. O oh, thou before whom all words recoil. You know, it's like we throw our uh, flaming torches towards the sun, but they never make it to the sun. They uh, fall down to the earth. Next on The Wisdom of Faith with Houston Smith.
the power of a life. This is charisma, and the charisma comes from that spirit. The force of tradition. I envy uh, the rituals of the Sabbath. Reflections of the one creator. Thank mm-hmm. you.